Hello everybody, I'm here today to talk about how to work in cloud native security and what the security role involves and how to get involved if you want to move into security. Um, if you don't know me, I'm Justin Cormack. I've been at Docker for five years now as an engineer. Um, I'm also on the CNCF um, Technical Oversight Committee. Um, I live in Cambridge, UK. And I'm at Justin Cormack on most of the internet. I'm so I'm quite easy to find if you remember my name. This is uh, Cambridge. It's up the road from where I live, where, where I've been uh, spending my time in lockdown. Um, this is a sort of kind of, I like to see Cambridge as a kind of tech village. It's um, really you've got technology and farms and fields right next to each other, which is kind of nice. Um, these are, this is radio telescopes where I've, right by where, where pulsars were discovered 50 years ago. I kind of got into security by mistake. I didn't ever set out to be a security person. So I think I probably got quite a good uh, idea about how to get there by mistake. If you want to get there by mistake or even on purpose. Um, I, uh, I, I started off being exposed to security for the first time really um, when I was many years ago I was at university I was working as a sysadmin and every machine had a public IP address and that really did make us a interesting target for people not really to hack us they weren't that interested in us but they're mainly interested in uh, getting our bandwidth and being able to hack other things from there um, I thought the role would be mostly about configuration management and stuff like that but actually there was turned out to be a lot of security into it after that, I kind of drifted away from that, started doing other things. I moved into development. I worked in financial services, got exposed to risk management and the idea of, you know, taking, you know, taking calculated risks, which was a useful idea from the security point of view. And I spent a lot of time learning the internals of things, um, which I think is really useful. I spent a lot of time um, in the internals of Linux when I was working on Unikernels, um, you know, you have to understand Linux if you're trying to replace it. And um, I did write some fun blog posts like 11 syscalls that suck and 11 syscalls that rock the world. Um, you know, just about the obscure corners of that world. You know, it's kind of, um, you know, kind of fun and there's a lot of detail and, and things inside that's useful to know. Um, I, when I started Docker, I the first security related thing I did was work with Jesse Frizzell on the setcom filtering for Docker. Um, I still maintain that. It's kind of interesting. I actually I mean, it can just spend some time working on it a bit more, um, rewriting the policy um, a bit from the experience we've had. It's also interesting because Kubernetes has been trying to build a standard setcom policy for. Uh, some years now, and this has been taking a long time. Um, and I, but it's an interesting area, so and it really helps knowing the internals of the system calls that you're filtering there. Um, about three years ago, I moved full time onto the security team at Docker, um, and then I led the security team for a while. And now I'm back to not just doing security. I also do. I'm a. I'm a I've become a generalist again. I'm a senior engineer across everything we do at Docker. So kind of um, moved around to and from security in my career. Um, I'm also involved a lot in the security community. Um, I was particularly with um, CNCF SIG Security that started a couple of years ago as the safe working group, and then we turned it into an official CNCF group, um, and it's become very successful. Um, so do get involved if you're interested. We've got um, talks at KubeCon, of course. Um, and it's um, we've basically been involved in you know working with CNCF projects on security, working with um, the end user community on security and helping them get involved and um, and helping the TOC review projects for security and helping the projects themselves understand security. I also am maintainer of Notary, which is a CNCF project, and I've been spending a lot of time since um, November or so working on Notary v2, which is a 
rewrite and reworking of the whole security model for container signing with Amazon, Microsoft, New York University, and, and other people. So um, that's really been a really interesting project and um, good fun. Um, again, we have talks at KubeCon about that, so come along, listen to them. I'm a security advisor for ContainerD now, the ContainerD project, so um, that's a new role. Um, also, I've spent quite a lot of time bringing security to a wider community. I ran tracks at um, QCon New York last year, from which these two talks were from, the maintaining the Go crypto libraries, which was um, by Filippo. I was really interested in having a talk about what maintenance is about in, in security, not just writing new things and um, you know developing new protocols, but actually just maintaining a, the world of cryptography that end users and the program language use. It's a great talk. And Kate Sill's talk on making NPM install safe, which is all about program language security, how we can make it so that you can import something with NPM, but it doesn't have capabilities to do to own everything in your in your program and do anything it wants. So how, how can we restrict capabilities? So again, another great talk. And I think these kinds of um, things are very important um, in terms of bringing security to a wider audience. Um, also worked on the noise protocol framework, which is a kind of alternative to TLS, but based on simple cryptographic primitives. It was really, I learned an awful lot just helping work on the spec and doing pieces around that. Also got an interest in capability-based security. I've done some talks on that. Kind of neglected areas of security, I guess. Um, there's lots to learn, and I think that learning about the broader area is really important in order to give you a better perspective on what's going on and why things are like that and what the problems with security actually are. Um, the most important things you can learn, I think, in security... Um, I talked about, you know, knowing sort of system calls and things and networking. Knowing some areas in detail is incredibly important, both for offensive and defensive security. You need to know the, the you know, the sharp corners and the difficult bits and the unknown bits and the bits that people can exploit. Um, and that really means diving down deeply into how things work and not just having a kind of, casual surface i know how to use the library of to do this but i don't really understand the internals because that's like it's the bits that are not doing what they're supposed to do that are important in security and this is the bit that really separates the people who can write new exploits or fix things that are difficult from the people who can just run a script um you know security issues are the real boundaries of the usual need to play around understand break things fix things get deep inside the internals and you know the protocols and the um implementations and and so on so there's there's a lot of detail work that's important but it's not just about code security is very much not about code it's important to spend time in the real world with real people who are using code, using computers, you have got problems, feel empathy for them and understand what their problems are and what they're trying to solve. It's, um, it's most of the time people don't think about security, don't care about it. Um, it's not an important thing. You know, it's not um, something they deal with on their daily basis. So you have to not be the person who comes along and like in this drawing just you know locks things up and takes away the key and says this is secure now because i've got the key and you haven't um you know the best security is there supporting how people work it's not making them making things difficult for them and that's really really important that's what you're trying to do you're trying to help people you're not trying to lock things up um the uh, follow-on from that slide is this slide where you know the user can't use the locked up cooker, which is all nice and safe and secure, but has to improvise and then sets things on fire. You know, and that's, you know, the reality is the users have to get things done. And if they have to get things done by, with the tools they have, they will. And those tools might not be so suitable. So you need to be, you need to be working with what people are doing and understanding what they're doing and not just being sitting along isolated saying what they should be doing 
Also, I think it's really important to both break things and fix things. There's a sort of divide in the security world between sort of black hat, white hat, you know, the breaking things and fixing things. It's a not actually a great divide. I think that just breaking things is not sufficient to be a fully rounded security person. You need to also learn how to fix things because it's actually difficult. Um, there's compromises and the messy real world things we're talking about. Um, you know, there's there was actually a post to the Linux kernel mailing list recently saying, please don't send us any more security issues you find with the, the fuzzing tools because um, we've got loads of them already. We actually just need help fixing them, not breaking things. You know, it's a, it's a balance. You know, you can write automated tools that break things quite easily and then find thousands of errors, but fixing them is work and people have to do that work and it's important that you're one of those people who does that work not the person who comes along and just tells people they have work to do help them out help your help your colleagues out wanting you know being angry about the state of the world from the security point of view is kind of good in a way because we have to get it better but just burning everything down is not the answer we have really you know you've got to work how we fix the stuff that's there, how we encourage people to change how they do things and so on. So there's breaking and fixing and working with other people is really important. Working with other people actually is very important. In working in security is not just an engineering job. You get to meet everyone else in the company as well. Um, you get to meet your lawyers. Um, these are These people are lovely people to work with you know they uh, you have to get to know them you have to understand how they work you know, how they, what how they want you to write things down or not write things down and um that's really um you know not you know i got way more exposure to lawyers when i was working in security than before um you'll meet your pr team because security issues are communication issues too um i was lucky to work with a really um great woman who had uh, worked at Intel doing Spectrum Meltdown. She was she really had a was good at keeping calm and working out how to communicate things. Really, really good to learn from these people as well. Um, but so, yes, that's important too. You know, security is a, you know, security instance and things are difficult stories to tell and difficult things to explain. And uh, it's it's difficult work and there are people who are really good at this um so you need to work with them you have to sell security as a business you have to explain to people why it matters and which things matter more and which risks are important and which are not so important again that's it's about balance and working out priorities and compromises and which things to do now and which things to do later um you can't have there's no point having everyone you know just spending the time doing security fixes if you then run out of money but then on the other hand when things are important they have to get done and it's important to be able to persuade people about those things and security products and a really interesting part of work too and just adding security features to to products that you have to be able to work with a product team and um work out which things would make a good product and, and so on. So there's a whole lot of product work that's really interesting and you need to get involved in as well. So thinking of it as, as just a an engineering job where you sit down and just hack on things is not really, you know, the whole of the role. And it's really important to um to understand that and think about those other parts of the role as well. Um there's a lot of demand for security people. Uh, the estimates I could find was that there would be three and a half million unfilled security jobs worldwide in 2021. I don't know if that figure is really accurate or what it means. And, um, you know, are there, are there going to be, you know, if three and a half million jobs don't go filled, what happens and so on. But I mean, it's, it, it is an increasingly important area it's definitely hard to hire people. Um, I, I spend a lot of time doing hiring and it's really difficult to find people. And um, so I do believe there's a shortage and, uh, you know, salaries are good in security. And, uh, and I don't know if that entirely reflects the three and a half million shortage or anything, but, you know, it, it's definitely a role where there is definitely demand. 
Um, and you don't need formal security qualifications. You don't need to be in a kind of hacker who's hacked high profile websites and been arrested or anything. You don't need to be a great developer to work in security either necessarily. Um, you need to be able to, I mean, I think that for all kind of roles in computing, being able to code is useful, but, um, Reading code is a really important skill in security. You've got to be able to understand other people's code, find bugs in other people's code, find security issues in other people's code. Um, so reading code is actually important. Understanding code, finding things that are likely to be a problem, being able to find out where in the code they're implemented. If you're you know, finding issues in open source code, which a lot of the time you are now, um, rather than closed source code, you spend less time actually reverse engineering what the code is and more finding issues, which is really important thing to be able to do. Um, there are formal qualifications, but you know, I, I've never had any, I don't think that they're necessary at all. Um, so what, what in particular about cloud native security? Why is cloud native security different and important now? And why is it, you know, something that we talk about specifically? Um, everything is cloud in cloud native. That's the um, um, really important thing. Uh, before cloud native, we actually had, a, you know, we, there was a thing like there was hardware security and hardware security was kind of, you know, firewalls were, you know, physically wired up with cables. There was this amazing thing called the data diode, which is kind of weird bit of history. They probably still exist in some places, but it was a one way network cable where you could send things, but not receive things or vice versa, um, designed so that data could only flow in one direction. Um, you obviously have to use uh, network protocols that don't have um, acts because um, you can't make a thing that only acts can flow back, but um, you can send UDP packets out one way. Um, and, you know, these were kind of hardware security mechanisms, but nothing really works like that anymore. You know, your firewall is just another piece of software. Your, um, your cloud provider, you know, it's just has networking that you can reconfigure in any way you want. You can make any sort of service talk to any service if you just rewire the infrastructure. Um, so everything's just code. So you can't, you, there's no sharp separation anymore. So this really changes everything about security because it changes, you know, what, um, what matters about security changes, you know, the, the separation of concerns. You can't separate security from development and operations anymore. We have this kind of DevSecOps idea now that, you know, de operations, development and security have to work together because there isn't these, there aren't these hard physical lines where things can't cross and things can only go in one direction. You have to program them to only go in one direction. Um, also, everything cha can change much more quickly. You can redeploy code multiple times a day, and each of those redeploys could break the security model. So there's, you know, you have to be, there's no kind of, you know, review panel once a quarter for security changes or anything like that. Everything has to be tested in real time. There's new places to attack. Supply chain attacks have become a real focus recently because, if everything's code, well, if you can modify the code or modify the way that the um, code is being up, the uh, updates of the software are going to another computer, then um, you can basically change everything's been deployed and add backdoors or remove security pieces or whatever. So everyone has to get involved in this together now. Um, this chart comes from the Sneak um, DevSecOps um, security report recently, and it shows that. Like we're getting a little bit better at spreading responsibility for security between developers and ops and um, and security teams, but there's still it's you know those those should be there shouldn't be people saying no one is responsible for security and everyone should be saying that um, development security and operations are all equally responsible for security both 
in the software and in the infrastructure. You know, so we're we're not there yet. It's important to you know, on as your journey to to being someone who works in security. If you're working as a developer now, you know, it, one of the things you can do is just spend time working and understanding the security and the code you work on. Understand the threat model. This threat modeling book um, it, by uh, Adam Shostak is is really good. It's just understand how to think about threat models. Think about which bits of your code matter. Where who's responsible? Which bit of code is responsible for protecting what? Um, that just it's really important just to you know take that time and think about the you know the domain and what you, what your what you, what your security risks and threats actually are. Um, security is really a kind of thing, is is a kind of code quality. It's an interesting kind of code quality because, um, you know, code that always does the right thing, even in bad circumstances, is secure code and quality code. So just handling errors, handling the unexpected things in a in a secure way is important. You know, if you just ignore errors and carry on, then someone can use that as a as part of an attack you need to understand the issues in the you know in the domain you're working in if you're working on websites you know cross-site scripting and all those things are, are things that you should be you know they're the security problems in your field that you should understand and understand where they come from and how, understand how you fix them and understand how you how you can either test for them or not make those mistakes in the first place. You know, are there libraries you can use? Are there techniques you can use to not have those errors? Um, and can you write, you know, you should write security tests. It's really important to have tests for security so that security critical things don't break again in future. Um, again, you know, as you roll out code, you don't want some security, some vital security thing to be missed out because of it doesn't get deployed correctly or whatever. Um, some of those tests should be, you know, um, when you're building your code, but you also runtime tests are really useful to make sure like if, if something doesn't get deployed, that leaves your security open. You don't want to fail open. You want to fail closed. Um, it's worth spending time to think like an attacker. Um, that was actually one of the things I did in one previous role. I'd spe- allocate some time on a mid mid Monday morning to find security bugs in the products I was working on. And, you know, some you'd spend, spend an hour or two each week and try and attack it. And sometimes you'd find something, sometimes it would be a dead end. You wouldn't get anywhere. Sometimes you would find, you wouldn't find anything, but you, if you don't think like an attacker, you won't um, ever explore those parts of your program. And actually as a developer, you often know where the, where the things are that, you think that there might be weaknesses because they're things you were a little bit uncertain about when you're developing them. Maybe there's a to-do in the code that shouldn't be there. So spend time doing that. And also learn from external audits. External audits are really valuable because those are other people looking at your code and you can learn from the way other people look at your code and the things that they find, you know, what kind of problems there might be and learn more about security from that and help you on your journey towards becoming a security person. Another thing I really need to talk about is burnout. Burnout is an area that particularly affects um, people who work in security. I think I mean it affects all all of us, of course, and um, you know it's a, it's an important thing to be aware of. But in security roles, in particular, often you're working in a kind of isolated environment where you can't talk to people about your work sometimes because it's confidential. Um, you're working on things that can't be disclosed yet or can't won't ever be disclosed. So that's kind of isolating. Often because of difficulties in hiring, there aren't enough people in security. So you might be overworked and um, that's a common cause of burnout. And you're kind of living away from the happy path. You know, the happy path in, in programming is, you know, where everything works as intended. It's the things that you spend my time writing tests for security people are thinking about all the the unhappy things and um you're kind of living away from that people become paranoid about attackers the attackers are out to get you um that's um you know can be a problem as well so it's really important to find friends outside security and outside your out completely outside your work who you can you know spend time with and it's also important to find a 
community inside security as well so you don't feel kind of so so alone and um you have other people you can talk to about the, the kinds of things that you're concerned about so thanks very much keep connected um i'm justin cormack stay in touch i'm happy to always talk talk to you directly if you want to get in touch with me um thanks for listening to this talk and it's uh, enjoy the rest of kubecon thanks